Hello, everyone. We're here for the very end of I Survive the Destruction of Pompeii. And I left you guys at a very critical moment. Vesuvius has erupted. Pompeii is in panic. Um, Festus is dead. He was hit by a flying boulder, which, by the way, is a scene in the book that my husband insisted that I put in. He said, you have to have a flaming boulder. Um, so we are now going to pick up where I left off, where um, people are realizing that something terrible is happening in Pompeii and people are trying to leave. So I remember that the last time we were together, I really wanted you to be thinking about Marcus and how his character had developed, how he had gone from being this um, person who felt weak and trapped and how he is slowly gaining power. Um, and a sense of himself. So pay attention to that a little bit. This is going to be, these are three really quick chapters and we're going to see Marcus's transformation kind of complete. And I'm really, I'm, I'm very excited for you to think a little bit about that. So here we go. Chapter 14. It seemed the magistrates had listened to Festus's visitor from Rome. Within minutes, guards were rushing out of the forum, shouting out warnings. Leave the city, go directly to the gates, they commanded. Tata looked at Marcus with relief. They had done their duty, and now at last they could leave Pompeii. But as they soon discovered there would be no easy escape. Marcus and Tata joined the sea of people streaming down the main street toward the city gates. There were rich men and slaves, parents with babies in their arms, and children clutching their robes. Some dragged carts piled high with clothes and dishes and baskets. Others lugged sacks. As they passed the gladiator barracks, Marcus glanced inside the open gates. There was a man man's body lying motionless in the glass. A pillar smashed across his back. With a jolt, Marcus realized it was the Lanista. Tata saw him too, but Tata quickly looked away as he tightened his grip on Marcus's hand. Cyclops must be somewhere in this crowd, Marcus realized, but Marcus was no longer afraid of him. Everyone in Pompeii was fighting the same enemy now, the most heartless killer of all, Vesuvius. Marcus and Tata inched along with the crowd. The sounds from the volcano were getting louder, but most frightening was the darkening sky. An enormous dark cloud had swept down from the mountain. It stretched over the city, turning the day to night. The cloud was black and boiling, and it rumbled with thunder, and then the cloud tore open. Bits of rock fell from the sky. They were very small and light, almost like bits of ice. Tata caught some in his hand. Hardened ash, he said. Ping, 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 they hit rooftops. Plop, 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 they splashed into fountains. They bounced off Marcus's head and shoulders and skittered across the street. But within minutes, the sprinkling of rocks had turned into a downpour. The rocks pounded down, hitting the stone streets and rooftops with an ear-splitting clouder. Bam, bam, bam! The crowd erupted in panic, pushing and elbowing and shouting. Somebody shoved Marcus and he almost stumbled. An old woman fell, but the crowd stampeded over her. The rock seemed to be getting bigger, pounding harder and harder. Dust rose up, making it hard to see. Marcus clutched Tata's hand. He felt as though they were caught in a stampede of terrified animals. Hold on tight, Tata shouted into Marcus's ear. I want us out of this crowd. They pushed and squeezed their way through, dodging sharp elbows and scratching fingers. Finally, they burst their way out of the crush of screaming people. They hurried into a narrow alley. Too dangerous, Tata said breathlessly. Many people are going to get trampled. He pulled Marcus into a doorway. They pressed themselves against the wooden door, trying to escape the hail of rocks. But the downpour was even stronger now. Tata pointed to a small temple just ahead. We can wait here until it stops. They pulled their tunics over their heads and waded through the river of stones. They were just steps from the building when, whoosh! Marcus's heart stopped as he looked up. It was a huge fireball bigger than the one that had killed Festus. Kaboom! The explosion knocked Marcus back. The last thing he saw before he fell was a huge chunk of rock smacking Tata in the head. Marcus hit the ground hard, but within seconds he was back on his feet. He charged over to where Tata lay crumpled on a bed of stones. Marcus dropped to his knees, grabbing Tata's hand. Tata, he cried, but Tata just lay there completely still. So now we're at chapter 15. Tata was breathing. Marcus could see that, but 
Then why didn't he open his eyes? Why didn't Tata answer when Marcus called his name? The rock seemed to have knocked him into a deep and terrible sleep and Marcus could not wake him up. The storm of rocks continued. Flaming boulders whooshed through the sky, their explosions booming all around. Somehow Marcus managed to drag Tata through the rocks with a strength he never knew he had. He hoisted Tata up the five stairs and let, that led through the temple's open doorway. He lay Tata on the cold stone floor and collapsed next to him. Hours passed before Tata's eyes finally fluttered open, and even longer before the fog cleared from his eyes and he could sit up. With each passing minute, it seemed, the mountain's fury grew stronger. The booming and whooshing and thundering and pounding had melded together into a bone-rattling roar. The walls of the temple shook and groaned. They were running out of time, Marcus knew, and then suddenly Tata turned to him. He took Marcus's hand. My dear son, it is time for you to go, he said. I know, Marcus said. As soon as you're strong, we can... No, Tata interrupted. I'll never make it to the gates. But if you go now, you'll still have a chance. It took a moment for Marcus to understand what Tata was saying, that Marcus should escape by himself. No, Marcus said, locking eyes with Tata. Please, Marcus, I have thought about this. I have considered every idea. There is no other possibility. Marcus knew that this was right, but it didn't matter. I'm sorry, Marcus said, but I'm staying here with you. He looked away so Tata couldn't see his tears. And that's when he finally took a good look at the statue that stood right in front of them. The god with wings on his hat and on his sandals. Marcus's whole body tingled. The god was Mercury. A strange but familiar voice whispered in his mind, when hope is lost, follow the hand of Mercury. The words were so clear as though the old beggar woman was still right next to him. Marcus jumped up and went to the statue. He touched the marble, half expecting the statue to turn to flesh and blood, for Mercury to scoop him and Tata into his arms and fly them to the heavens. What is it, Tata said. He turned to Tata. That old beggar woman, Tata, Marcus explained. There was something else she said to me. He spoke her words slowly to Tata. Marcus waited for Tata to tell him it was crazy to believe in the ranting words of a stranger, but Tata didn't shake his head. He stared at the statue intently, studying it, and Marcus understood that at that moment it didn't matter whether the beggar woman's words were science or madness or magic. Marcus felt the truth of her words in his heart, and so it seemed did Tata. Tata rose to his feet, shaking off his pain and weakness. Marcus, he said, his eyes wide with excitement. Look at the statue's right hand. Marcus saw it too. It seemed the statue was pointing to something. But what? The floor was bare, unless. Marcus dropped to his knees. He felt around the tile floor until he felt a gap between two large tiles. His heart pounded as he dug his fingers into the gap. There was a groove in the side of one of the tiles. He lifted it up and he could barely believe what he saw underneath. There was a trap door. Okay, and look, this is the picture of that scene. You can see the god Mer Mercury. Here's a little trivia question for you. In the Roman mythology, this god is called Mercury. See if you can do some research and find out what the Greeks called the same god. It's a different name, but the same god. Chapter 16. They lifted open the door and peered into the darkness. All they could see was a rickety wooden ladder leading down into the blackness. The cell of sulfur wafted up, stinging Marcus's eyes. It must be some kind of tunnel, Tata said. But where does the tunnel go, Marcus said. There are tunnels under many Roman cities, Tata said. Most leave out of the city. People used to use them as an escape in an enemy attack. But what if this tunnel didn't lead out of the city? Before he could ask, Tata was climbing down the ladder and he was quickly swallowed by the pitch darkness. Seconds later, his voice echoed up from below. Yes, Marcus, it's a tunnel, come quickly. Marcus climbed onto the ladder and fumbled his way down, down, down. When he reached the bottom, Tata took his arm. This way, Tata said, turning him, follow closely behind me. They moved blindly into the narrow passage, crawling on their hands and knees. It was hot as an oven, and the passage was so narrow that their shoulders brushed against the rough sides. The stink of sulfur made Marcus gag. Sweat poured into his eyes. His heart hammered. 
The tunnel seemed endless, and the farther they went, the more terrified Marcus felt. What if the sulfur, ki sulfur killed them? What if the tunnel collapsed? Marcus tried to fix his thoughts on his heroes to gather strength from the stories that had always inspired him. He imagined he was Odysseus braving the wild seas as he returned home from a decade of fighting. He thought of Hercules fighting the ferocious beasts, but those stories were of no help to him now. His muscles cramped, his arms and legs shook so violently that it was hard to move. A terrifying idea took hold of him that this tunnel would never end, that he would be forever trapped in this evil darkness, that they'd never make it out. But suddenly, his mind flashed to a new story, one that was still being written. And it was this story that gave Marcus the strength to keep moving. It was the story of an enslaved boy who saved his own father by hurling a live cobra through the air, who escaped from killer clouds, leaping flames and fiery boulders that came hurtling from the sky. This boy was not favored by the gods or aided by powerful kings. It was the strange words of a mysterious beggar woman that guided him, a tattered mare who carried him, and his father, so wise and good and brave, who showed him the way through the darkness. It was this heroic boy who kept crawling through the tunnel as tears poured from his stinging eyes, who found the strength to help Tata kick open the door at the end of the tunnel. They clawed through piles of rocks to get to the surface just outside the city gates of Pompeii. They staggered across a stone-covered field to the olive grove. The old white mare was waiting for them. Marcus put his face close to Peg's, looking into her gentle eye. Tata gently brushed the rocks and ash that covered her coat. You waited, Marcus said. Snort. Of course she hadn't left them. Marcus and Tata climbed onto Peg's back. Without so much as a tap, the mare took off toward Rome. She ran swiftly, her feet barely touching the ground. They were many miles ahead when the cloud of ash and gas above Vesuvius collapsed down to earth. The cloud ignited, turning into a flaming whirlwind that blasted down the mountain at speeds faster than any chariot. Within seconds, the city of Pompeii was burned and buried. But the horror of Pompeii was now behind Marcus, and all he felt of the mountain's fury was a whisper of heat on his back. He gripped Tata tightly, and together they looked ahead for the bright lights of Rome. And that is the story of Marcus and Tata and their escape from one of the truly the most famous disasters in all of world history, one that taught us so much about ancient Rome and what life was like, one that really um, is one of the most famous stories of archeology span because it was hundreds and hundreds of years before people discovered the city of Pompeii that had been buried and kept like a time capsule below 30 feet of ash and stone and rock. It had been preserved like a time capsule. So there were treasures under there, um, archeological artifacts that have helped us piece together the, pu the puzzle of what it was like to live in an ancient Roman city like Pompeii. Um, and of course also Vesuvius is a volcano. It was really the first volcanic eruption that was written down. There's a man named Pliny the Younger that you can look up. His name has a funny spelling, P-L-I-N-Y. And he was a teenager staying with his uncle on an island in the distance to Vesuvius and he witnessed the um, eruption and he wrote about it. And it's really one of the, it's the first scientific um, really description of a volcanic eruption in history. So that's a really cool thing that you can research too. So that's my quest for you today. There's so many doors of knowledge and fascinating facts that um, you might walk through after reading a book like I Survived the Destruction of Pompeii. You can learn more about archeology. span You can learn more about ancient Rome. You can learn more about the Greek and Roman gods and mythology. Um, you might have another idea of what you wanna learn about, but that's what I love about researching and learning about history is I wanna know more. So my quest for you today is to learn more. And I guess I'll see you at my next read aloud. I haven't decided what I'm going to read yet, but I hope it'll be something that you're gonna enjoy. Bye-bye.